better? Oh, wow. There we go. We had our normal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get there eventually, guys. We had our, uh, our we've had some, uh, some things dying over the last couple of weeks, one of which was our normal headset mic and some other things as well. So thank you, sound team, for improvising <laughs> and making this all work as we wait for some, uh, some backup supplies to arrive. Um, yeah, so the last couple of weeks, uh, we have been, uh, we've heard from Arthur, and he was, he's doing a series that uh, he's titled, How Then Shall We Live? Uh, and it's been really great. I hope most of you have been here for that. We've looked at having the mind of Christ. Uh, so they looked at the mind of Christ, and then we looked at the life of Christ as he's gone through uh, this series. And it's been really, really encouraging. Hopefully, you've had a chance to uh, be a part of that. If not, I would encourage you to go on the YouTube page and, and check out those lessons. Uh, it goes along really well with our theme for the year, which is building up. And uh, really the, the idea of our theme for this year, building up, is making sure that our lives reflect the reality of what we say we believe. That this life is short, right? And, and that one day we will be with Christ for all eternity. All eternity. And that is, we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but that's a hard thing for our, our minds to wrap around. Eternity. But the idea of building up is, is that these truths of the gospel and what Christ has done, done for us should affect the way that we live now. It should affect the way we live. It should affect our relationships with people. It should affect uh, our interactions with people. It should affect uh, the, really every aspect of our life, the way that we use our money, the way we spend our time. All of these things should be affected by the fact of what Christ has done for us and the gospel, the good news of the gospel, and really wanting to make sure that other people know the good news of the gospel. So today, uh, I think as we jump into 1 Peter, uh, we're going to see this theme of building up in 1 Peter as well. He is You'll, you'll see that the, the title for this is uh, this series is Stand Firm because uh, standing firm is part of, it's a very important thing as we look at our, our Christian faith and our Christian life. There's a lot of temptation to, to fall away. We, we go through difficulties and struggles in this life. And, and we'll look at kind of the two options that we have as believers. Either we allow trials, troubles, tribulations, difficulties to pull us away from Christ or we allow those things to draw us even closer to him. And Peter addresses this in 1 Peter and into 2 Peter. Uh, we're going to see that the idea of faith and trust in God are a reoccurring theme in this book. And he writes this letter specifically uh, to Christians that seem like they're enduring persecution and difficulties and again, as he does this, he is encouraging them to stand firm in their faith. Continue in holiness. And there's a lot of other things that we'll get to look at as we go through this book. So let's pray and we will jump into our text for today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and for your love for us. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for the wonderful truth that through his perfect life, his sacrificial death, and his glorious resurrection, that we have hope. Lord, I pray that you would help us as your children, as your followers, to live lives that reflect this truth. I pray that you would help us to, to truly consider this each and every day, and that it would change the way that we, we interact with others, the way that we, we live our lives for you, and, and that our lives would reflect the reality of eternity. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us a way to know you, and that you've given us direction for life. And we pray that again that you would just be with our time this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So, a while back, there was a book that was published, and I'm trying to remember how many 
copies it sold. It was millions upon millions. I think it was over six million, if I remember correctly. The title of this book was Your Best Life Now. Your Best Life Now. And it was written by a pastor, shockingly. Uh, it was written by Joel Osteen. And he said, <laughs> in, he says one of his quotes from this book is, don't just accept whatever comes your way in life. You were born to win. You were born for greatness. You were created to be a champion in life. I want you to consider that and weigh it against what we've read this morning from First Peter. And to really weigh it against the hope of eternity. Because if this is your best life, man, like so many of us, that is a depressing thought for me. If this is the best that it gets, man, what am I doing? I think John MacArthur had a good response to this. He said, if, uh, he said, the only way you're living your best life now is if you're going to hell. And that is a, a harsh response, but it's true. For those of us that are inside of Christ, or in Christ, this is nowhere near as good as it will get. It does not even begin to touch the, the amazing things that Christ has for us in heaven. And that is what Paul is, I mean, what Peter, sorry, that's gonna, I'm going to want to do that. <laughs> yeah. You can tell we teach a lot from, from Paul's letters. Uh, but I, I caught myself doing that all week as I went through this, even writing. I would write Paul instead of Peter. Um, that is what Peter is talking about in this passage. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. That is the opposite message of what we have just heard from the author of Your Best Life Now. And then this is what, again, Peter is addressing here. He starts off in verse 3 by saying this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the first thing I want us to see that, is that we as believers are given a living hope. As God's children, we are given a living hope. We are encouraged in this book and in our lives to look at and to hold to living hope that Christ has made avail available to us through his finished work on the cross. Peter describes our salvation as a birth into this living hope that we have in Christ. And, and when he uses, I think we struggle with this a bit because when we hear the word hope, we use the word hope like maybe it'll happen, right? Like, I hope so, right? <laughs> and, like, and, and that's not what biblical hope is. That's not what hope is when we read it in this context. It's not a, a questioning. But rather, it, hope, when we read it in the Bible, is an eagerly expectation of fulfillment. It's an eager expectation of fulfillment. Or the time awaiting a promise to be fulfilled. We can see that all throughout, we, we, remember last year, we looked and we went through the Bible kind of chronologically and we looked at the, the, the main story and throughout the main story of the Bible, we looked at, at God's plan of redemption. We saw over and over again God's faithfulness to his word. That he is a God who keeps his promises. He is faithful. And so when Peter uses the word hope, which he uses the word hope five times in this short little let letter, five times, when he uses the word hope, he is not saying, like, eh, maybe. He is saying, as we await the promised fulfillment of what God has guaranteed to us, 
This isn't a maybe or an I hope so. It is we are waiting for Christ. Again, this is a guarantee on which we wait. Because God is a God who keeps his promises. And it, we get that idea even in the, worst, in, in the way that, that Peter uses the word living hope. Living hope. Because that implies that, that this hope is, is ongoing. It is still active. It is still currently being carried on. It is a living hope. It also implies that what Christ has done on the cross, and Peter even says right here, from his resurrection from the dead. So because Christ lives, our hope lives. It is in Christ's resurrection that our hope is founded on. And Peter says, it is a living hope. So first, Peter addresses the need for us to have hope in what Christ has done as we go through this life. Second thing that he, he, he addresses is that we are gifted an inheritance. We're gifted an inheritance. I'm going to read verses 4 and 5 again. It says, so it says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So we have this new birth, we have this hope in Christ. And now Peter says, wants to point out the amazing inheritance that we have because of what Christ has done. We are children of God, we are born into his family. And this inheritance from God is unlike any earthly inheritance. Think, think about it, when you're left something by, by someone that passes away here on this earth, right? There, there might be the depreciation. If it's a home, if you're not taking care of it, it's going to crumble and rot. If it's, if it's money, some places you have taxes on that money that you have to pay, like inheritance taxes, all of these things. And all of these things in this life are temporary. And, and Peter is pointing out that the inheritance we have in Christ is imperishable, meaning it endures forever. It endures forever. He says it's undefiled, it's pure, and it's unfading. It is not diminishing in value or worth. The unchanging God has given us an unchanging inheritance. It is a wonderfully amazing truth. And not only this, God is the source of the inheritance, right? He's the source of this inheritance, but he's also the protector and the guarantor of this inheritance. Meaning that we see that, that, that Peter says that it is being kept in heaven for you. Who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith. He is the one that gives us the inheritance. He's the one that, that guarantees the inheritance and, 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 and protects the inheritance through faith. This, when we read this uh, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, uh, I, I thought of Matthew chapter 6, right? It, it, there's so many connections between what we, we see Peter saying here and what we see Jesus saying in Matthew chapter 6 on his Sermon on the Mount when he talks about storing up your treasure in heaven. What, is, what does he say there? He says, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust can destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. Right? What our, the, the, the thought is, is that our, our treasure is safe in heaven. It will not be diminished. It will not go away. It will last forever. He says, but do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where both moth and rust destroy and where thieves can break in and steal. 
the things of this world are temporary. They only last a given amount of time. It's temporary. But Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. And Peter is reminding us here that the, the inheritance that we have in Christ is just like where Jesus has told us to lay up our treasure. It is safe. It is unfading. It is imperishable. Peter then says in verse 6, in this you rejoice. In this you rejoice. And this is this, the place we're going to spend most of our time this morning. In this you rejoice. And what does he go on to talk about? He goes on to talk about trials. He says, sorry, I'm, I lost my place here. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. In this you rejoice. He's talking about the trials that they're enduring. And he says, not that they, they can rejoice, not that they should rejoice, but he's commending them because they are rejoicing in the trials that they're facing. He's, he's, he said, you, you have this hope. You have this inheritance. And, and because of that, you are able to rejoice in the middle of these troubles that you are enduring. They are rejoicing. Peter's addressing this. He addresses more about joy here in verse 8. And we'll look a little bit more at that here in a minute. But the people that Peter is writing this letter to are enduring persecution and suffering. It's, it's not certain. There's different ideas about when Paul wrote this letter and where he was and who he was writing to. There's uh, some debate about all of those things. But one of the prevailing thoughts is that he, he may have been and likely was in Rome at the, during this time. And it would have been the, during the time of the Emperor Nero. And for those of you that don't know, <laughs> Nero was notoriously brutal. Um, one of the things that happened under the rule of Nero is that Rome caught on fire. And I think it was nine of the 12 districts were just completely burned. And people blamed Nero because supposedly in the beginning of the fire, he didn't really seem to care about it. There was uh, the story that he went up and he played an instrument. I can't think of which one it was. He played an instrument while... Rome was on fire and burning, and he just didn't seem like he cared. And so people were mad at Nero, and Nero then looks for somewhere to place the blame, other than himself, obviously. And he doesn't have to look very far, because there's this new group of people that have been popping up. They're growing rapidly in number, and it's a little bit concerning, because for a, a nation that, that is kind of known for conquering other places, right? <laughs> the main thing that these people are known to stand for, is for loving one another, but then that love even extending to their enemies and loving those that are even against them. And they were not anything like what was expected of the people of Rome. There's a ton of stories you can read about what the early Christians in Rome did, from wandering the streets and collecting babies that were set out to die to many other things, but they were very different than the society in which they lived. And so we see that Nero sees an opportunity here. And so he begins to blame the Christians for the fire. Persecution begins. There's a, a famous uh, Roman historian. He's considered perhaps the, the best historian of the day. His name was Tacitus. He said this. Following Emperor Nero's command, this is a quote, let the Christians be exterminated. They were made the subjects of sport. They were, they were covered with the hides of wild beasts and killed by dogs. 
or nailed to crosses or set fire to. And when the day waned, burned to serve for the evening lights. These Christians were being severely persecuted. They were being hunted for sport, nailed to crosses, and in the evening used as torches. And it's very possible that Paul is writing this letter to these believers. And he says, in this you rejoice. In this you rejoice. Peter is not calling them to joy in this passage, but he is commending them for their joy and for the rejoicing that they already possess. He then, as he talks about these trials and about suffering, there's a few things that he highlights in just this small section. The first thing that we see is that trials are temporary. He says, although for a little while, trials are temporary. Because this life is temporary, our trials are temporary. But heaven and its joys are eternal. Peter is reminding him, them of the temporality of this life. James chapter 4 talks about how our life is a vapor. It appears for a short time and it vanishes away. Our lives are incredibly short. And again, it is hard for us to understand because we cannot begin to really even understand the vastness of eternity. But it's so important that we, that we try because otherwise we will become consumed with the things of this world. If we do not work, if we do not watch our hearts and guard our hearts against loving the things of this world, if we do not tell ourselves every day that this life is short and eternity is forever, then we will find ourselves pursuing the things of this world Peter has already reminded them of the amazing hope that they have, of the unfathomable inheritance they have in Christ, and now he is reminding them that life is short. Thus, anything that we suffer and we go through in this life will be almost unquantifiable or not able to even be counted when we consider eternity. Psalms 90 is the oldest psalm. It's written by Moses. And in this psalm, I would encourage you, maybe you write it down, Psalm 90. Go back, read it this week. The oldest psalm. Uh, for the sake of time, we won't read it. But, but we see in this psalm, it's, it's a psalm of Moses again, and he talks a lot about how short this life is. He says, to you, God, a thousand years is like yesterday. It's nothing. And he goes on to talk about how we live our, our 70 to 80 years maybe, right, that we get in this life. He's like, it's, it's so fast. Especially when we compare it to the, the greatness of God and the vastness of eternity. And he says towards the end of, the, of this psalm, so teach us to number our days. So teach us to number our days. Keep in mind. Moses is saying, remember how short this life is. The things of this world will pull at your heart and your attention. But remember how short this life is. And remember that only what we do for Christ will last for eternity. Everything else will be burned up. Everything else will be wasted. Only what we do for Christ will last for eternity. Peter here is not diminishing the suffering of the people that he's writing to. 
He's not trying to make little of their difficulties and their struggles. Peter understands and is enduring persecution himself. Peter goes on to be crucified himself. He's not diminishing their suffering, but he's commending them and encouraging them to remember that this life is short. He's encouraging them to remember that eternity is a long time. So trials are temporary, and we see that the trials serve a purpose, and this is what makes the difference in the life of a believer, is that trials serve a purpose. Trials serve a purpose. We see that trials vary, and they bring pain. So again, he's not diminishing. But trials serve a purpose. Let's, let's read this again really quick. He says, In this you rejoice, though for, although now for a little while... If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the return. Sorry, I lost my place. That's what I get. Uh, Honor at the revelation. uh, Sorry, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, for Christians, trials serve a purpose in our lives. He talks about how it grows our faith. And we're going to look at that here more in just a second. But there is a purpose to the trials in a Christian's life. There's purpose to the trials that we're dealing with. He also talks about how trials are different for each and every one of us. And that's, if I were to sit down with each and every one of you, you know, we come to church, we all put on our our smiles and our best faces, right? We shake everyone's hand. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, everything's great. My family's great. Everything's great, right? But if we were to sit down one-on-one and I were to say, all right, how are you? What are you struggling with? What's going on in your life? I would almost guarantee that every single person in this room has some difficult things that they're dealing with. Some of you perhaps more difficult than others. And that's part of it is sometimes we're afraid to share our difficulties because we're like, well, I don't have it as bad as this person or that person. But there are difficulties that are going on in each and every one of our lives. We are all dealing with struggles, sadnesses, difficulties, For believers, there's hope in these things because they serve a greater purpose in our lives. We see that he, he talks about how it's, it's, it, it doesn't perish like gold, right? It doesn't perish like gold. It says, genuine faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. You think of gold, how do you purify gold? It is thrown into an insanely hot fire that melts it. And all the impurities rise up to the top. And they're able to more easily be removed that way. And this is what he's talking about here. He says, you're tested by fire so that you can be refined. There is a greater purpose to the trials and the difficulties that we go through. And each one of us goes through different trials and we deal with different things. And again, Peter is not diminishing the suffering, but he's acknowledging their suffering and their trials. And he's acknowledging that it's not fun. None of us want to go through trials and difficulties, right? So the rejoicing isn't because they're going through the trials and the difficulties. That would actually maybe, you know, you're like, what's, why are you? But it's that the fact that they're able to rejoice through them. They're not like, yay, I'm, I'm really dealing with some, some difficult stuff. But they're able to rejoice through the suffering because where are their eyes focused? They're focused on heaven. 
They're focused on the fact that they are being even purified through these difficulties. And then the last thing I want us to see is that trials produce faith. Trials produce faith. This is what he says. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold. Your faith is more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The tested genuineness of your faith. Trials for the Christians should not diminish joy, is what we're, we're seeing here. Trials for the Christians should not diminish our joy, but they should confirm our faith. They confirm our faith. They grow us. They don't, they don't uh, remove our eternal outcome, but instead they call us to look to and to long for our eternal home. Trials are to cause us to look to and to long for our eternal home. We will face difficulties and struggles in this life. But these things serve to confirm our faith. One of the things that a lot of Christians struggle with, even sometimes Christians that have been Christians for a really long time, is there fi- there's times where we still doubt our faith. There's times where we still question. Where we still think, Is it worth it? Is the Christian life worth it? And what Peter is saying here is that the trials that we go through are to confirm our faith. Ask any Christian in this room that's been a Christian for a while. Ask any any believer and say, when are the times that you grew most in your faith? And I can assure you that almost undoubtedly, He will tell you about a time of difficulty and struggle. A time when they felt they were at their lowest. That's when God grew them the most. And I know that is the case in my own life. I can think of two circumstances in my life where I went through, for me, again, I don't like saying it because when I'm tell you what it is. Some of you, it sounds so pathetic, but we all face different trials and difficulties. When I went through that, it was really hard. I remember telling someone, I I think I told the men's group a couple weeks ago, I would would go in the shower at night and I would cry every single night because I didn't want my wife to hear me. It was hard. It was difficult. (laughs) But I look back on that time now as almost seven years ago, maybe a bit more actually, maybe eight, and I am so thankful for that time. Because I say God did ten years of work, ten years plus of work in one year. (laughs) Something that it would have taken me so much longer to recognize in my own life to work, to, re- to, to try to do my best to fix God, brought me to my knees and humbled me and forced me to look at my weaknesses. And he grew my faith in him and my trust in him. George Mueller was an evangelist. He was the director of, uh, of Ashley Down Orphanage in uh, Bristol, England. Uh, he had an orphanage. He started 
I think it was, I have it down here, 117 schools, Christian schools, uh, that were specifically geared towards helping the less fortunate receive a quality Christian education. And it was so great. The, the education was so wonderful that many people actually became frustrated with George and said that you're putting too much effort into educating these, these poor children. You're, you're, trying to, you're trying to mess up the system that we have going on. But George also, during that time, again, he ran that orphanage, and over 10,000 children went through that orphanage during his lifetime. And again, they were, they were known for being incredibly well-educated young men and women. And George did all of this without ever raising funds. It's amazing. He did all of it without ever asking for a single penny to be donated to the orphanage. But instead, he prayed. He prayed. And he assured everyone that that if we have a need, God will meet the need. There's a story that's told that uh, one morning they woke up and the children all come and they sit down at the breakfast table and the, the cooks who worked at the orphanage come out and they'd woken up early that morning and worked, woke George up and said, we don't have any food left. We've used everything we have. There's nothing. We can't give the kids anything for breakfast today. And so that morning, George and the staff had sat down and had a prayer time together. And George was quoted as, as praying and, and thanking God for what he was going to provide for them. And he was so believed so much that God was going to answer his prayer that he called all the kids in. He had them sit down and he asked them to pray and to give thanks for what God was going to provide for them. So the kids all sit down, they pray and they, they thank God and, and the kids don't know that there's no food, but they say, thank you God for the food that you're going to provide for us today. And, and just as they Say amen from their prayer. There's a knock at the door. And it's two people. One is a milk delivery person whose, whose cart had broken down right outside on the street. And he said, it's going to go bad if I don't give it to you. Take all of the milk. So they all go out and they, they bring in the milk. And the second is a baker who said, I can't tell you why, but God woke me up in the middle of the night and said that you needed me to bring to bake bread and things for the orphans. And so he came in carrying baskets and trays of food to deliver to the orphans. We see in this, and this is a quote from George Mueller. He said, God delights to increase the faith of his children. We ought instead of wanting no trials before victory, no exercise for patience, to be willing to take them from God's hands as a means. Trials, obstacles, difficulties, and sometimes defeats are the very food of faith. Often our temptation as Christians is when we begin to suffer, when we go through the slightest difficulty, we start looking for a way out in our own power. Right? We, we want to run around and, and try to find the quickest way to escape the issue that we're dealing with. And there's, there's, right, we don't want to just sit in our misery either, but in, we would be wise to pause and ask God, are you trying to teach me something through this difficulty that I'm facing? And Lord, if you are, help me to see it. Grow my faith and my trust in you. Again, so that the tested genuineness of our faith. Lord, help me to grow my faith and my trust in you. Again, one of our biggest temptations is to doubt our salvation, but it is through these trials and these difficulties that our faith is proven, not to God. <laughs> God already knows about your faith. So the trials and the difficulties that you face aren't for, for his purposes, but it's for yours. God looks down and he says, this is for your good. And it's in order to grow us. 
It's in order to grow us. Here's another quote. I actually had a third quote, but uh, I'll, I'll skip that one for now. There's another quote from Stephen Charnock. He was a, a uh, Puritan preacher, and he wrote a little, a little poem. It's very short, but he said, he said this, Could saints but see what fruits their troubles bring, amidst those troubles they would shout and sing. No doubt but saints in glory and wondering stand at those strange methods few now understand. Could saints but see what fruits their troubles bring. Amidst those troubles, they would shout and sing. No doubt but saints in glory and wandering stand at those strange methods few now understand. We often do not understand what, Christ, what God is doing in our lives. We go through trials and difficulties, and when, they, when they're going on, it's hard to see what God is doing in them. And I can think even now, of things that we have faced as a church. The loss of a pastor. Things that are difficult and hard. And when you're going through them, you don't understand what God is doing. And uh, even now we don't understand, right? But we trust that God is in control and that he is moving and working and that One day when we're in heaven, we will get to see the beauty of what Christ has done. As as Stephen says here, no doubt but saints in glory and wandering stand at those strange methods few now understand. We may not understand even in our whole lifetime all the things that God does. But one day we will. lastly, I want to I close with this quick thought. I want to read verses 8 and 9. Again, this is Peter talking. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith. What is the outcome of your faith? The salvation of your souls. And I want you to, again, think about who wrote those lines. Peter has talked about faith, I mean about love and trust, or, or faith, right? Trust, trust is, and in any relationship, those are probably the two most important things, love and trust for one another. Those are the two things that Peter has talked about. And what do we think of often when we think of Peter? What are some of the first stories that come to your mind? Sadly for Peter, Many of us don't instantly think of Matthew chapter 16 where he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. We don't think of his high moments, but sadly for many of us, the thing that popped into our mind is Peter's faith failing as he walks on water. Right? Oh, he's the one that that, that jumps out of the boat, you know, and then starts to go and his faith fails and he starts to sink cries out Jesus save me that or we may think of when his commitment and his faith in Christ was tested during Jesus crucifixion and he denies Jesus three times and I love this how he ends this section because it's almost he's again he is commending them throughout this entire part He's commending their love and their faith to Christ. And he says, you haven't seen him, yet you love him. Peter knows that in his own life, he saw Christ in all that he did. And yet when it came to his time of crucifixion, he failed. And his love failed. And he says, you, you, uh, let me read this. I don't want to misquote the Bible. That's a bad thing. So he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. 
He said, you, you don't see him. Again, he said, you, you never saw him and you love him. You don't see him now. And yet you believe. Peter, in times of, of, of his life, he knows that he struggled with love and faith. And he's commending them here. And he's saying, well done. You don't see him, but you love him. You don't see him now, but you believe in him. It makes me think of John chapter 21. One of the last interactions that Jesus has with Peter. Peter is sitting back and he's quiet, likely because the guilt of his having betrayed Jesus. And Jesus lovingly comes to him and he says, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know I love, feed my sheep, Peter. Jesus again says to him, Peter, do you love me? Yes, yes, I love you. Tend to my, my sheep, tend to my lambs. He says to him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And he says to him, I'm actually, I'm going to turn there. John chapter 21. He says, turns to him the third time. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he, he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then Jesus goes on and kind of predicts the way that, that Peter is going to die for him. It's no coincidence that Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Because Peter was asked three times if he knew Jesus and denied him three times. Jesus was saying, do you love me? Do what I've commanded. Feed my sheep. And Peter here is commending them and saying, well done. You've never seen him, but you love him. Well done. You don't see him now, but you have faith. Continue in those things and you will be able to endure the trials and the difficulties that come your way and remember that this life is short. I, I pray that for each of us in here we would keep an eternal perspective that we remember that the trials and difficulties of this life are temporary and that that then would push us to follow Christ better that it would grow our faith and that as we go through difficulties, we would be saying, God, help me to grow. Teach me. Grow my faith and my trust in you. If you're here and you do not know Christ, may today be the day that you come to know him. Don't let the trials and the difficulties of this life be for nothing, but instead use them. And you can only do that if you're one of God's children. Otherwise, what is, what is the point of the trials and the difficulties? Just come to him today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for who you are and for what you've done for us. That because of what Christ has done, you have given us hope a hope that, that doesn't fade away, that lasts for forever. You've given us, a, a, you've given us an inheritance that, that is imperishable, unfading. Lord, and because of what you've done, we can face trials and difficulties and struggles and persecution, and we can rest and find peace and comfort in you. Lord, help us as your children to not waste the difficulties that we face, but that we, in each of the trials and struggles that we face, that we would look for ways that we can use those things to become more like you. Grow our faith. Teach us to love you more. We thank you again. It's in Jesus' name.
Jesus' wonderful name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen, Joe. Thank you so much for sharing um, a good reminder and an encouragement for us as children of God. And when we go through these seasons of life, that we can remember what the Lord has said to us this morning. Um, as we were worshiping, this verse came to me, and I thought it was for me or just something that I would read. But I would like to share this verse with all of us, but especially with those who are going through seasons of trials and tribulations, loss, way, um, loss or waiting or grief. Lamentations 3 um, from verse 19 says, O oh Lord, remember earnestly my affliction and my misery, my wandering and my outcast state, the wormwood and the girl. My soul has them continually in remembrance and is bowed down within me. But this I recall, and therefore have I hope and expectation. It is because of the Lord's mercies and loving kindness that we are not consumed, because his tender compassion fail not. They are new every morning, great and abundant is in your stability and faithfulness. I pray that this morning, especially for those who are hurting and waiting and in conflict or in not an easy season that great is Lord's faithfulness in your life. May he continue to show his faithfulness. May he give you that joy that you cannot find anywhere else, that it doesn't make sense. May the peace of the Lord be with you as you go through this week and the rest of the year. May the Lord continue to be your portion. May he be your hope. May he be all that you can long for. And may your faith rise so that you may continue to worship him even through the difficult times. So we have come to the end of our service.